Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today on an issue that concerns uh, the senators uh, notified we're in a quorum call. Uh, I ask that the quorum call be lifted and Not I ask permission to, to speak as if in morning business. Not objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Privacy is a fundamentally and almost uniquely an American value. It's the reason that the colonies rebelled, one of the major reasons they rebelled against the British. The invasion of our homes by British soldiers without court approval, the lodging of those soldiers in our homes without permission, the invasion of the fundamental rights of privacy were one of the basic reasons that this nation sought independence from the British. And so Throughout our history, privacy has been a value, a fundamental right, affirmed again and again in our courts, enshrined in our Constitution, and ingrained in our way of life. And that is a reason that so many of us were offended and regarded as reprehensible and repugnant, a practice that was revealed recently, a practice involving employers coercing and compelling the disclosure of login information, usernames and passwords to private accounts and private systems by job applicants. And the same kind of coercion and compulsion applied to current or existing employees as a condition of their continuing in their jobs. That kind of practice is abhorrent. And it is the reason that yesterday, along with a number of my colleagues from both this body and others from the House of Representatives, introduced the Password Protection Act of 2012. These practices are unacceptable for a number of reasons. An employer has plenty of ways, other than accessing private accounts, Gmail, storage data and accounts on Facebook or other social networking sites to obtain information that's relevant to employer needs and interests in offering a position to someone. There are means, other means, that are adequate and acceptable. What's not acceptable is coercing and compelling that access to an applicant's email account, which could contain all kinds of personal information that is inappropriate and unnecessary for an employer to know. Information that is irrelevant, in fact, to the terms and duties of a person's employment. Second, the disclosure itself endangers the security of that applicant's personal data as well as the websites themselves. Too many careless companies too often have lost customer data or employee information, allowing it to be breached through poor security practices. That is a reason that I proposed a measure that would require safeguards of that data, a separate measure that is before this chamber now to assure adequate remedies when there are breaches to require systems in place by employers to guard that information. An applicant who takes care to use encrypted networks or other personal safeguards may find his or her personal information, financial data, medical information, breached through no fault of his own simply because the company fails to take adequate steps to safeguard it. There's another reason why these practices are abhorrent, and that is identity theft by the employer itself, a continuing danger. And that kind of potential danger is a real one, 
that certainly raises this interest very squarely. But maybe as important as any of these other interests is the danger to compromise of the security of third parties, loved ones, family, friends, who have entrusted the person who is applying for a job or who is employed by a company that breaches its responsibility by demanding this information. When an employer logs into a, an employee's personal accounts, he sees that employee's emails with her spouse or Facebook pictures of her siblings and her children. Those parties are completely unaware that one of their friends or family members employers may be reading their correspondence or looking at their pictures. A daughter who tells her mother of a pregnancy, a son who acknowledges an addiction to a parent, a father who speaks of his wife's illness in confidence to his children, each has an expectation of privacy that is betrayed and violated when an employer demands login information, usernames, or passwords from a job applicant or a current employee. The impact is not only on that employee or job applicant, but on innocent loved ones, friends, family, whose confidential information, emails, and other data may be exposed. And of course, when information is exposed in this way, there's the danger of discrimination based on marital status, status, sex, gender, other kinds of prohibited categories. And so, barring the compelled disclosure of this information actually is an aid to the employer because it assures that none of these hiring decisions or firing is based on a prohibited category or discrimination. The Password Protection Act addresses all these concerns and prohibits employers from forcing prospective or current employees to hand over personal private financial information that has no place in the hiring process. The bill prohibits an employer from compelling or coercing an employee or prospective employee to provide access to a private system as a condition of employee, employment. This means that an employer cannot compel a prospective or current employee to provide his Gmail password. An employer cannot force an employee or a prospective employee to log onto a password protected account so that the employer may browse at the account's contents. The Password Protection Act also very, very importantly prohibits retaliation, which is a danger with current employees. That retaliation can take all kinds of forms, but the demand for login information, usernames, or passwords certainly creates a kind of presumption that the refusal to do, do so prompts action that can be regarded as a retaliation. And an employer who violates these duties, legally required duties, is subject to a penalty of $10,000 for violation. So this act will protect employees from unreasonable invasions of their privacy, unreasonable invasions that have no common sense basis, and it prevents unintended consequences. It doesn't prohibit social networking within the office on a voluntary basis. It does not bar employers from conducting valid investigations of misconduct. It does not prevent an employer from controlling the company's own system, its own Facebook account, for example. And it provides that states may exempt certain categories of employees, such as individuals who deal with children who are under 13 years of age, or federal employees who may have access to classified or secure national security information. And it also 
provides for reasonable exemptions that state law may make for state employees who are involved, for example, in law enforcement or correction. Like many in this body, I've heard from countless Connecticut citizens who are not only offended but outraged by these practices reported in the press. Fortunately, many employers have shown they get it. They understand this deeply held value and they have rejected these possible practices. And many who might have been contemplating engaging in them have likewise retreated and reversed their decisions. And so merely shining a light, showing a spotlight, and raising the issue has brought many employers to understand the common sense force of objections to these practices. I want to thank grassroots groups like the 57,000 citizens at Bold Progressives who signed a petition at protectourpasswords.org to let Washington know 57,000 of them strong, that they reject the idea that their employers will force them to hand over this personal private information. I want to thank the activists at Access Now who are generating similarly a groundswell of support for this initiative. And they're working to protect employee rights on the job. And I want to thank also companies like Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google, who have cooperated and supported this effort because they have an interest in preventing invasions of privacy, demands for information that are unnecessary, repugnant, reprehensible, and unacceptable. And I thank all of them for working with us on this legislation. And finally, I want to thank Senators Schumer, Klobuchar, Shaheen, Wyden, as well as Sanders and Akaka, as well as Representatives Heinrich and Perlmutter on the other side of this body for working with me in introducing this bill. I'm hopeful that the Congress will consider it promptly and successfully, because I think it sets a marker and provides a milestone in protecting individual privacy against abhorrent invasions in the workplace and elsewhere that have no place in American life. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The senior senator from Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. President, unless uh, we act quickly, uh, students across the country will face the largest increase in subsidized student loan interest rate in more than 40 years. In the last 40 years, the interest rate on subsidized student loans has never doubled from one year to the next. Yet that is what is happening unless we act on July 1st, just 52 days from now. And unless my colleagues on the other side of the aisle relent and allow legislation to fix this problem to come to a vote, we will see a doubling of the student interest rates from 3.4% to 6.8% for all borrowing going forward to, uh, for education in the United States related to the staff at loan program. I know that the President of the Senate has been taking an active in leadership role, uh, Senator Brown of Ohio. He is in the forefront, along with Senator Harkin, to ensure that we can move effectively to prevent this doubling of the interest rates. We're at a time where, if you look across the financial industry, borrowing rates are at, at historic lows. We are essentially providing banks to the Federal Reserve with near 0% interest loans. So it is incomprehensible at this time that we would actually double the loans that we would charge to students who are going to college. Uh, students and families cannot absorb these increases. It's a tough economy. They're facing rising tuition, dwindling state support for higher education, making it more difficult, more complicated, and to add to the burden by doubling these loans is poor, bad public policy, and it directly affects uh, middle-income Americans, and in the longer run, the competitiveness, the productivity, 
and the success of our economy in a very competitive global economy. We have to ensure also that we're not piling more and more debt on students. Uh, we have reached a point where a student debt is becoming so extraordinarily difficult to bear that it inhibits people from going to school, it inhibits, inhibits them from pursuing various professions after they graduate from college, uh, and if we add to this mountain of debt, we'll create a huge financial problem going forward, uh, not just for the individual borrowers, the student borrowers, but for our economy. In fact, according to Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, over 60% of jobs going forward uh, will require some post-secondary education by 2018. That underscores the essential need to go to college. In 2010, only 38.3% of working age adults had a two-year or four-year degree. So we're looking at a, a gap, a gap of the prepared individuals with college education versus those jobs in the future and the not too distant future that will require college education. In order to fill that gap, we have to get more and more young people into school, into higher education, and beyond. And by doubling the assistance rate, we will not be achieving that goal and that objective. That's why I introduced the Student Loan Affordability Act in January to permanently keep this interest rate low. And that's why I was joined by uh, Senator Brown of Ohio, Senator Harkin, and many others uh, to step up and to make it quite clear that we cannot afford, uh, for our country's sake and for the sake of many, many working class families across the country, to double this rate. We are debating today the Stop Student Loan Interest Rate Hike Act. This is a fully paid for one year extension of the current rate to extend it for a year so we can look for a more permanent fix. And my colleagues on the other side of the aisle insist that they agree that we have to do this, yet they continue to filibuster this legislation. They continue to prevent us from bringing it to a vote. It's clear that they have an alternative view in terms of how we pay for it. Well, let's put that to a vote. But let's not stop dead in its tracks a policy that both sides claim has to be fixed, that we have to avoid the doubling of this interest rate. Now, what we have done is we have proposed to fix this problem and pay for it in a fiscally responsible manner by closing a glaring egregious loophole in the tax code that enables certain wealthy individuals to shirk their responsibility to pay payroll taxes. This loophole predominantly benefits professional service providers like accountants, lobbyists, and lawyers who derive all of their income from their professional labor, but because they choose to mischaracterize their income as a distribution from a subchapter S corporation instead of wages, they avoid paying payroll taxes. In 2005, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration issued an audit report calling for action on this loophole, which was described as, in his words, a multi-billion dollar tax shelter. The report also described a disturbing trend of businesses changing their status to the subchapter S corporation for the purpose of avoiding payroll taxes, not for the purposes of expanding employment, not for the purposes of uh, a new and more efficient way to use capital, but essentially a tax dodge to avoid payroll taxes. The Inspector General reported, quote, in fact, advising small businesses to shelter earnings from self-employment taxes through the formation of S corporations has become a cottage industry. A search of the internet yields multiple sites that offer advice, assistance, and encouragement to sole proprietors to convince them to become S corporations. The sole proprietors are advised that they can save thousands of dollars a year in employment taxes simply by incorporating. It is also possible on the internet to gauge the size of the savings using computer-generated savings amounts based on the user's entries for anticipated profits and chosen salary levels. Not surprisingly, the lower the salary chosen, the higher the savings become, reaching maximum savings at a salary level of zero. So essentially, what is being done in these professional corporations, or at least professional partnerships, these professional associations, is that they've glommed on to a very, very 
clever tax shelter. You incorporate a subchapter S, you have your employer pay the subchapter S corporation. That subchapter S corporation pays you a modest minimal salary, and the rest a dividends taxed at a different rate and not subject to the payroll tax. We're trying to close the tax hole. And following the indications of the Inspector General, a simple internet search confirms this finding. For example, one website has a section entitled, quote, how to reduce your FICA taxes if you own a sector S corporation. That section provides a step-by-step -step instructions on how to use this loophole and even provides advice on how to avoid being caught up in an audit. The website advises owners of S corporations to pay themselves the lowest possible salary to reduce their FICA taxes even if the distribution they take is a product of their labor. Here is how the website explains how to take advantage of this loophole. It explains that as an employee of your S corporation, your salary is subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes, but the net profit of the S corporation is not subject to the payroll taxes. So the website goes on to explain, quote, the idea is to pay yourself the lowest possible salary to minimize Social Security and Medicare taxes, close quote, then you take the remaining net profits as a distribution, which is not subject to payroll taxes. This is a loophole we're trying to fix. This loophole should be fixed regardless of how we use the proceeds. But frankly, we have a situation now where we have a pressing need to help families across this country avoid a doubling of the interest rate on student loans, and we have an egregious loophole that will allow us to responsibly pay for the maintenance of the lower interest rates. This seems to be uh, an issue where public policy is well balanced. We are told by our colleagues they agree with us. You can't double the interest rate. Well, they should also agree with us you can't continue to tolerate this uh, loophole. And this is a, not only an appropriate way, but indeed seems to me the best way to achieve our objective of preventing the increase, the doubling of the student interest rates. So, Mr. President, uh, we uh, are working very hard to try to get this bill up for a vote. Uh, if there are other proposals uh, with respect to tax loopholes or the ways in which we can pay for this, other than the the proposal, frankly, that the, the House has suggested, which is go into the prevention funds for health care reform, which to me is adding and compounding to our not only fiscal problems, but also going forward uh, to our health care problems. Uh, we are right now recognizing that unless we aggressively have prevention programs, our health care costs will explode going forward. Every day people talk about the increasing cost of obesity in the society. Well, how do you get essentially uh, a handle on that? You have to have resources for prevention, for counseling, for education, for nutritional programs. Uh, we take those funds away, we just run the bill up for health care. And that bill ultimately is being paid in many cases by the same families who are struggling to find a way to, to send their children to college. So I would urge all of my colleagues to, to move, get this bill on the floor. Uh, if we want to debate about different methods of uh, payment, that's fine. Let's take votes and then let's move on and pass this. I think uh, we uh, understand that time is running out. July 1st, this will, interest rates will double. We have seen progress. Uh, going back a few months, our colleagues on this side were proposing budgets that uh, recognized, indeed, uh, supported the doubling of this interest rate. In March, uh, throughout the spring, uh, they were assuming and they were supporting measures to double the interest rate. Well, the good news now is they've said, no, we can't do that. We've got to keep the rate at least for the next year. We're one step closer 
to solution, but the final step is going to have to be responsibly paying for this proposal. And we have presented, Senator Brown, Senator Harkin, myself, Senator Harry Reid, and so many others, not only a responsible way to pay for it, but we have underscored and highlighted what is a egregious loophole, a tax shelter, a very clever ploy to avoid paying taxes on your wages by, through the mechanism of a subchapter S corporation, magically converting them into dividends. Well, I think we can accomplish two important public policy goals in this legislation. Keeping interest rates on student loans at the current level, helping families send their children to school, and closing a glaring loophole, a tax dodge in our tax system. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Senator from Rhode Island. The quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
Madam President. The Senator from Ohio. I ask Ms. Yes, Senator to dispense with quorum call. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I have seven unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session. They have approval of the majority and the minority leaders' party leaders. They have the majority, the proof of the majority and minority leaders on asking Amps consent these requests be agreed to and they be printed in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I want to join uh, Senator Reed of Rhode Island, who just spoke um, very persuasively about, certainly about the need to freeze interest rates for Stafford loans for college students in America and also spoke, I thought, very convincingly about closing a tax loophole that, uh, that has clearly been uh, used to avoid, legally, but to avoid taxes by lobbyists, consulting groups, some lawyers, all of whom are making, uh, are using this tax loophole uh, to, to the tune of, of tens of thousands of dollars in many cases. The, case of former Senator John Edwards and his law firm, not like most law firms, but in his law firm and, and former Speaker Newt Gingrich, wanted Democrat, wanted Republican, has shown the, the, the size of this loophole and how it can turn into tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, again, legally, I'm not accusing either of these gentlemen of, of illegal activity, only taking advantage, advantage of a loophole that, that we should close. But I come to the floor today more to make the case for how important these Stafford loans, these subsidized Stafford loans are for college students. In uh, my state of Ohio, similar to the presiding officer state of North Carolina, we have um, lots and lots of, of uh, hundreds of thousands of students that um, use these Stafford subsidized loans. In Ohio, it's some 380,000. I assume in North Carolina, it's a number not too far off of that. Uh, students that have seen, have, have enjoyed, if that's the right word, 3.4% interest rates on their loans rather than something higher. And, and what, what's, what's discouraging, Madam President, is that this, is a, um, this was a bipartisan effort. In 2007, the year I came to the Senate, uh, the student, the, the, the President Bush and Democrats majority in both houses joining with many of our Republican colleagues in this body and the House of Representatives locked in the student loan subsidized Stafford loan rate of 3.4 percent for five years from 2007 until this July. That expires in July. It was bipartisan then. It should be bipartisan now. But a couple of days ago, the Republicans filibustered. I'm hopeful today that or whenever this next vote's taken that they won't. And I encourage students, I'm going to, for just three or four minutes, uh, Madam President, read a, a small number of letters and stories that I've gotten from students in my state of Ohio who have come to my website and told us their story. And I urge people watching today from Ohio to come to this website. It's, um, it's brown.senate.gov slash college loan stories, brown.senate dot gov slash college loan stories and just tell us your story because the more I think Madam President I, I'm not so cynical that I, I think that when my colleagues start listening to people at home listening to students I, I was at Wright State in Dayton the other day near, near Dayton and University of Cincinnati and Ohio State in Columbus and Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland and I met with students and listened to their stories and several of them stood up and talked about what these, these student loans mean. And, you know, already the average student, the average student that graduates from an Ohio four-year university um, graduates with debt of, a, of, of about $27,000. That means it's much harder for them to start a family, to buy a, a car, to buy a home, uh, to start a business. And that's why it's so important not to heap more burden on them, put more debt on them. And I'll just close, Madam President, with reading three letters. Cody from Delphus, Ohio, went Northwest Ohio. I graduated high school with the goal in mind to get my doctorate in pharmacy. After five years of hard work, I'm nine months of practice rotations away from achieving my goal. Along with that achievement comes a paralyzing amount of college debt from attending a private university. I have hopes of doing an additional two years of residency to specialize in critical care trauma, but since residencies pay less than half of a pharmacist's salary, I may not be able to go further and reach that goal. Help me reach my goals by keeping interest rates low, by helping create affordable means by which these low-income families can attend college without having to accumulate the debt I have had to. Allow youth to reach their full potential and be able to serve society in their best capacity by finding a solution to the rising cost of an education. 
Nanya from Worcester, Ohio, east of where I grew up in Mansfield, about 30 miles away, writes, going to college changed my life. The only reason I even considered going to college because my mom did. The only reason, reason she was able to go was for student loans because my oldest daughter saw my mom and me doing it. She's now attending college. My family had a rough beginning. My mom and I survived sexual abuse and the disease of addiction before finding a solution. School has been her way out. My mom now has a bachelor's, is working as a licensed social worker. I'm on my way to a bachelor's as well. How can I in good conscience say to my daughter, go to college if I know she'll never be able to pay off their loans? I'm a student assistant at Wayne College. If it weren't for the availability of school loans, I'd never have stepped foot in the building that is now the center of my world and my daughter's world. We go to school to make a better life for ourselves. In Rebecca from Lorraine, where I lived for many years near, near Lake Erie, when I matriculated at Lawrence University, a private liberal arts college in Wisconsin, my family couldn't afford to contribute more than a few hundred dollars a year to my tuition. I was Pell Grant eligible. I took out Stafford loans. I also took out a private loan from my parents' credit union. I committed to the full number of hours of federal work study that I was eligible for. Even as a freshman, I was deeply aware that the Pell Grant, Stafford Loans, and federal work study programs were giving me access to an excellent education that would, be, would have been beyond my reach. I've worked hard in my classes. I graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude in two majors, chemistry and English. I worked hard in extra in co-curricular activities. I edited the college literary magazine, served as president of the campus feminist organization. I worked hard in my on-campus jobs, grading papers, tutoring, uh, mixing reagents in the chemistry stock room, washing dishes in the student union diner. I chose to go to graduate school in chemistry. I got a PhD in Stanford in 2003. I'm now a tenured professor of chemistry at Oberlin College in Ohio. I teach bright young people who are interested in making the world a better place. I also conduct research in ovarian cancer detection that's been funded by the National Institute of Health. It breaks my heart to think if I were a high school senior today, I might not have the same opportunities to achieve. Stafford loans, Pell Grants, federal work study programs. I mean, these three letters, Madam President, I just, these were not dif different from the others. I just picked the top three that my staff gave me from stories that we've gotten because of our website. And I'll repeat the website again. It's, shared, it's, it's Brown Senate dot gov slash college loan stories. But this tells you about work ethic, it tells you about opportunity, and I, I, would, I would illustrate it in one other way, not as, I, I can't do it as well as Nanya and Rebecca and Cody did, but we all remember, if we pay attention to American history, in the 1940s and 50s, the, 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 the GI Bill gave literally millions of young American men and women returning from serving their country the opportunity to go to school. And what the, what the GI Bill did was help millions of individual Americans one at a time. But what that did collectively is it raised all boats. It created a huge amount of prosperity for our country because all these people went to college. A lot of these people bought homes. A lot of these, the, the, the colleges were growing and expanding, creating more jobs. These people started businesses. These people were productive workers. These people invented things because they had the education to go to college. So with these Stafford loans, it's not just helping Cody and Rebecca and Rebecca's students today and and Nanya, it's also helping all of us as a society, whether you go to college or not. Some people don't want to go to college, fine. We have career centers and trade schools and community colleges to learn welding, to learn um, carpentry, to learn how to be a healthcare worker, uh, to learn rad tech or whatever people want to do or to go to a four-year college. Give them that opportunity because we don't just help millions of individual Americans or millions of individual young people. We help society as a whole when we do this. And I just pray and beg my colleagues, please pass this, keep student loan rates manageable, interest rates manageable, so we can have more, more Rebecca's and Nanya's and Cody's in our country. We will all benefit. Madam President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Senator from Colorado. Thank you, Madam President. I'd ask the quorum call be issued. Without objection. Thank you. Madam President, during the worst recession since the Great Depression, which we are now fortunately coming out of, the highest the unemployment rate ever got, even at the depths of that recession, for, someone with a for people with a college degree was 4.5%. We saw unemployment rates of 18 percent, 20 percent for certain groups of people, four and a half percent if you're a college graduate. It seems to me that in view of that, in light of that, first of all, that is an incredible stress test of the value of a college degree uh, in this 21st century that we're living in. And we ought to be making it easier, not harder, for students to go to college. However, as you know, interest rates on federal student loans are scheduled to double from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent on July 1st unless Congress can get out of its own way and do the right thing. And for the life of me, I don't know why we can't come to an agreement on this. This isn't a Democratic or Republican issue. The cost of college has increased 550 percent since 1985. Two-thirds of students in this country rely on loans to afford college. And in the past decade, average student loan debt has increased by more than 25 percent. This, by the way, is not a function of people not doing the right thing. It's a function of the fact that median family income has continued to decline in this country for the first time in this country's history, while the cost of college has escalated like crazy. And if this increase goes through, it would add thousands of dollars of debt to the more than 166,000 Coloradans who currently receive federal student loans. Increasing loans for students already struggling to repay their loans harms both individual students and our fragile economy. Madam President, when I visited the University of Colorado at Denver just last month, I heard firsthand from students about how important low interest rates are to their ability to afford college. Many of the students I heard from were worried that their student loan debt would prevent them from achieving their career goals or buying a house or making other decisions that they're confronting. In Colorado, the average student loan the student graduates with more than $23,500 in debt. Just in the last hour, Jeremiah shared the following story with me on Facebook. This is less than an hour ago. He wrote, I'm studying geography and environmental science with an emphasis in urban studies and planning at the University of Colorado Denver. I'm the first of my family to attend college, and 100 percent of my schooling is paid for by grants and student loans. I worry about the interest rate hike that's bound to happen this summer uh, and with the economy not in full recovery. I worry even more about securing a job after graduation and how to afford repayment of my loans, especially if interest rates are to increase. Madam President, as you probably know, in your state and my state, college uh, attendance is actually at a record high because there are young people all over this country, certainly in my state, that have sought refuge from an economy that doesn't have jobs for them on our university campuses which is a great place for them to be. It's a great investment in them and a great investment uh, in our future. But for Jeremiah and for thousands of others, millions of other students just like him, uh, we're threatening through our inaction to actually drive up the cost of college uh, when that's where they need to be. And that's the reason why in the past two weeks, more than 1,300 Coloradans have written to my office to demand that Congress act to prevent the student loan interest rate from doubling. Here's just one letter I received from Kim Haas, who's from Granby, Colorado. She wrote, while I try to keep informed, I don't generally make a point to contact my representatives. On the issue of student loan rates doubling, I had to speak up. My husband and I live in rural Colorado. I have been working toward becoming a professional counselor. Because of our remote location, I've done most of this online while staying home with my son. This takes a lot of self-motivation and time management skills. It also means taking on a lot of debt. Please take actions necessary to prevent my rates from doubling. It's imperative to our financial, vocational, and life success. Her life success. I suspect that most of these students aren't all that interested in what party affiliation uh, they're in. And I think that if they were here, 
uh, on this floor, which is empty today, uh, they could use some Colorado common sense to actually get this done. And in the Senate in Washington today, we're facing a filibuster, even though we know in the end we're going to find a way to do the right thing here uh, and keep these interest rates from rising. So once again, I urge my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, to come together uh, and give our students all across the country the security that they need to pursue their education. For them, this isn't a game. For the people that came to the University of Colorado at Denver a month ago and shared their thoughts with me, this isn't a game. This is real life. It's their lives. It's their futures. And they're relying on us to sort this out and get it done, and we should. Madam President, I'd ask that uh, the next portion of my remarks appear separate from the ones that I just gave. Without objection. Th thank you, Madam President. I, while I was here, I also wanted to take the opportunity to discuss the importance of reauthorizing the Export-Import Bank. Last month, while I was in Colorado, I had an opportunity to visit innovative businesses like Coolerado, which creates energy-efficient air conditioners, Sand Hill Scientific, which manufactures medical devices, and Leitner Poma, which builds gondolas for ski resorts. In fact, they are building the gondola that is being uh, installed at Vail, Colorado this, uh, this year to mark Vail's 50th anniversary. It was fun to see those American jobs being um, created for that great American industry. All of these countries rely on financing options from the Export-Import Bank to help them compete in the international marketplace. In fact, while I was visiting Colorado, I actually saw, literally when I was there, uh, I saw an 18-wheel uh, truck back up to the loading dock at Colorado to load a bunch of their devices to be shipped to Europe uh, as a consequence of the work that they had done with the Exim Bank. These are manufacturing jobs right here in the United States stamped Made in America on the outside of uh, these devices. Uh, and we've been unable to get this through the Senate. Colorado used credit insurance from the Export-Import Bank to help enter the international market. And as we emerge from the worst recession since the Great Depression, we should be looking for more opportunities to support the next Colorado, Sand Hill Scientific or Leitner Poma. Instead, We've been engaged in this prolonged debate about the very existence uh, of the bank. And now we're weeks away from the expiration of the bank's charter. I am quite sure that there's not a single one of our international competitors, Madam President, around the world that are engaged in this debate. In fact, they're engaged in actually, absolutely the reverse, which is the question of how to create more exports. Uh, for their domestic industries, and we should be doing the same. And as we look to strengthen, to reverse that curve I talked about earlier of median family, fall, of median family income falling, uh, and, and to see rising wages again in this country and create more jobs, we should be looking for opportunities to increase exports at small businesses like the ones I saw in Colorado. You know, we face a profound structural issue in the economy today. Uh, in this country. Uh, as I've said here on the floor before, our gross domestic product is now higher than it was before we went into this recession. And productivity has been going off like a skyrocket since the early 90s. As we've responded to competition from China and India, the use of technology to make uh, businesses more efficient, and the recession itself, which drove productivity through the roof because firms had to figure out how to get through these difficult times with fewer people. But median family income has fallen, and we have 23 or 24 million people in this economy who are either unemployed or underemployed. Wage growth and job growth, really for the first time in the country's history, has decoupled from GDP growth. And that happened during our last recovery. Uh, under the previous administration, I make that not as a partisan observation, that's just the time that it happened, we saw economic growth but we didn't see wage growth, uh, and we didn't see job growth. And now I fear that we're seeing the same sort of trend in our economy today. And there, there are only two solutions to that, or at least there are two important solutions to that. One is what I mentioned earlier, which is that 
education is vitally important because if you're educated, you're more likely to be able to get a job in this 21st century economy. Remember, the worst the unemployment rate ever got for people with a college degree was 4.5%. But the other part of that equation is innovation because it's businesses that are started tomorrow and next week and the week after that that are actually going to create jobs here that are going to lift wages. This is one of the reasons I've been so glad to work with the presiding officer as we think about new ways of approaching regulations uh, at the FDA to ask the question, are we driving bioscience here in the United States or are we driving venture capital offshore to look for other opportunities? We should be up day and night thinking about this in the United States Senate because that is how we are going to bring an alignment back between the economic growth that this, the, the economists tell us we're having and the job growth and the wage growth that people at home want to see. You know, there, there's a lot of talk in this chamber about winners and losers and how the government shouldn't pick winners and losers. You hear that a lot here. As if the current tax code isn't full of choices that have already been made about winners and losers. And a lot of those choices that have been made have been made about incumbents for the benefit of incumbents, not here, but incumbent enterprises. But it's the innovators that we're leaving behind. And as we think about comprehensive tax reform, which I hope we get to sooner rather than later, I think on every one of these questions we should be asking ourselves, is this credit or is this incentive or is this inducement more or less likely to drive job growth in the United States, to drive incomes up in the United States, to drive exports from the United States? And if the answer to that is no, we should stop doing it. This has to be more thoughtful than a fight between one narrow interest and another narrow interest. And the American people, I think, are demanding that, and we should respond. But in the short term, the work in front of us now is to get this Export-Import Bank bill to the floor, to get it voted on, and to pass it, uh, as they did in the House of Representatives yesterday. Uh, Madam President, I appreciate your patience, and with that, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
quorum call be vitiated? Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I wanted to come back to the floor because the Facebook page c continues to, to get updated. Phil Townsend wrote in, and I thought with a prescient question about what we're focused on here today. And here's how Phil put it. If you had a loan that would take you a decade to pay off, even if you had lived as cheap as possible and only ate ramen noodles, would you want its rate doubled? This is real life for the people we represent, and we should get this sorted out. With that, uh, Madam President, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.